All right. Um, thank you. And I also want to say thank you, Jacob, for putting together this uh, the, the series of workshops because they've been really interesting so far. And it's um, very unusual for me to get a chance to present my work on causation and explanation to an audience that's primarily comprised of people working in physics or philosophy of physics. Um, so I I haven't explained everything, so there might be questions that are more, um, could you say more about this account of causation in general when we get to the end? Um, but I want to try and motivate a certain kind of project uh, and why it fits in with um, physics in a certain kind of way. So uh, largely the, the, the talk here is I'm going to say that there's a certain kind of relationship that causation stands to, uh, to information that is parallel to the one that is uh, between work and energy. All right, so just as a quick outline so that you know what we're going through, I'm going to start by talking about the foundations of causation and essentially giving you a kind of um, optimistic meta induction on uh, what I think is currently happening in the discussions around causation. Um, and then we're going to segue to some discussions in causation and machine learning, uh, which is not something that I work on, but that I've been discussing with people in my university. And part of what we've been discussing is whether or not we're actually talking about the same thing. Is there a single univocal notion of causation that we're all working on? Or is there, in fact, several very distinct clusters of causation um, and there's no sort of like, uh, there, there would be an equivocation if we took ourselves to be working on the same uh, sort of relation. Um, so from there, I'm going to talk a little bit about a recent paper by Bernard Scholkopf. Um, he offers some really intriguing remarks about uh, what he took to be the energy revolution uh, that led to industrialization. And he sort of identifies the information revolution as where we're currently at. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how, in both of those two revolutions, we can use that as a way of understanding how causation fits into a certain kind of um, infrastructure of physics. So I want to be able to say that, you know, causation is adequately real in a certain um, very important sense of real without having to say that it's a, a fundamental feature of the world. Um, I then conclude by giving us a, a little example of why it's useful to treat these as univocal notions of causation at the end. So that'll be the um, the very short but hopefully clear enough payoff um, for making it all the way through. All right, so uh, I identify the kind of work that I do as working in foundations of causation. Um, and sometimes I talk about what I do as a kind of natural philosophy. Uh, I think that it's really an exciting time to be working in causation right now. And I think it's really useful to situate what's happening in causation in a much longer historical trajectory. Um, so. I'm giving, uh, philosophers are often, um, who discuss realism, talk about a pessimistic meta-induction on history. And I think right now we can be giving a kind of optimistic meta-induction on history vis-a-vis uh, -vis work in causation, because I think that causation is, you know, traditionally it's been a central philosophical topic, but in the last 15 to 20 years, it's really started breaking out of its original home in philosophy. And um, in some really exciting work has been happening such that it's almost to a place of complete autonomy from philosophy. Uh, so, you know, I think that it's useful to look at things like um, Kuhn's description of the route to normal science, where he says there's something that is usually um, sufficiently unprecedented and sufficiently open-ended as a new achievement, but that nevertheless is also very raw and incomplete. There's lots of loose ends. There's lots of things that need to be cleaned up. There might be different groups of people working on different things that haven't come together yet. And I think that's exactly the state that we're in right now um, with respect to research and causation. Uh, so I think that in the last, say, 15 years especially, there's been um, huge empirical development and a kind of validation that this way of approaching causation is fantastically useful, like not even just a little bit useful, but fantastically useful. And I think there's still pockets of largely independent work um, that are just in the early stages of integration and coordination. So I think that we're right at the stage where this is beginning to coalesce as a sort of full-fledged autonomous science, but that we're not quite there yet. It hasn't fully launched itself out of philosophy. So it's still in this consolidation process. Um, and I think that what happens, if you look at the at the Kuhn as a kind of model for understanding, okay, where are we in the, the trajectory of launching out of philosophy? 
um, I think that we're at the stage of sort of rendering a lot of these key terms much more precise in their application. So we need to be able to make much more fine-grained distinctions between different kinds of uh, causal terminology. And we need to do that in the context where these different pockets have often been using very similar terms, but perhaps in very different ways. Um, so there's a lot of variation in how some of these terms get used. So uh, I, I think the historical comparison is helpful. Um, so I'm teaching some early modern history of physics right now. And you know, moving from trying to figure out what vis viva is and vis inertia and distinguish distinguishing those from each other to a place where we can say no there's there's very clearly you know this is momentum and it's you know mass times velocity and this is kinetic energy and it's one half mass times velocity squared is a really important part of the precisification stage for the concepts we just didn't have sufficiently well defined and delineated concepts when we're at the vis viva vis inertia stage and we know that we sort of achieve something more when we've gotten to these uh, uh, more precise ways of distinguishing these things, even though they're involving, they both involve uh, um, mass and velocity. All right, so I think what's still happening right now um, that is required to solidify this, so that work on causation and causal modeling becomes something more like, you know, a new science that gets its own department within universities and has its own sort of uh, um, field going on is the rest of the sufficient basis of shared assumptions and exemplars and training. And uh, this is what foundations of causation is. So right now, there are certain kinds of things that you no longer have to argue for when you're giving talks in causation. Uh, when I first started working on this, you really had to convince people that you needed something like the notion of an intervention or like the notion of a do operator. And in the last 10 years, you just don't have to convince anyone of that anymore. Um, they're just sort of on board. OK, there's no amount of, of just mere probabilistic relationships that are going to be able to do it for us. We have to also have some kind of notion serving that particular purpose, um, even if the, the precise details of it differ. So I think there's been real advances in terms of the shared background assumptions that you don't have to redo every single time you're having a discussion. And that moves the discussion forward. And so the more you establish for the foundational part, the less you actually end up having to discuss the foundations. Once they're in place, you know, because they sort of uh, get out of your way. Um, so the optimistic part of this meta induction uh, is that I think you can actually get substantive guidance on what we should be doing right now and how we should be moving forward to the next steps by this kind of explicit reflection on what does it usually look like when other sciences have branched out from natural philosophy in the past and what were the stages that they went through. So how can we use this as a kind of blueprint or map um, of what's coming up. All right. Uh, so this is the part that I apologize if you're not more familiar with uh, work on causation. Um, I'm going to sort of point to some clusters that I think are taking relevantly different approaches such that we ought to approach them with caution that maybe there isn't a single unified notion of causation that they're talking about. Um, one of them is, of course, graphical causal modeling and causal based nets. So here, um, very early work by Judea Pearl and by Sperdy's Gleamer and Shinies, uh, and the work that's been developed on that is the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Um, there's also what now goes in philosophical and philosophy of science discussions under the heading of interventionism. And that's sort of, uh, it, it goes beyond the, the graphical causal modeling and it contains what uh, Jim Woodward, for instance, has described as a semantics for that kind of causal modeling. Nevertheless, there's ways in which what he's doing with interventionism and what they're doing aren't identical. They sort of come apart a bit. Um, there's also uh, a, a number of, um, there's, there's also some accounts that talk about physical causation or physical mechanisms. And then here the discussion really focuses on the kind of um, connection and connectivity and continuity between some cause here that, you know, mechanically or chemically bumps into in a very uh, physically explicable way along a chain to bring about some particular effect. But I think that's actually different than what we could be doing in causation and physics. So we'll get to this with Scholkopf in a little while, where he's like, you know, look, really what you're doing in physics when you're modeling things with, uh, say, like coupled uh, differential equations just is causal modeling. So when you talk about like forcing coupled harmonic oscillators, then you're just talking about causal, you know, 
causal, here's a cause, here's an input, and here's the system response, here's, a, um, here's the effect. So there's a lot of common terminology between these different groups. Um, and I think that these key terms are sort of things that philosophers have space to do more work on um, to see whether or not they're being used in consistent ways. So for instance, um, some of the key terms that I think are hot spots right now. So there's this notion of information that's uh, really taken off in a lot of discussions, including in philosophy of science. And there seem to be a whole bunch of different ways in which it's getting used. So information theory is, of course, fantastically useful in no small part because you can apply it to anything almost. And uh, that does mean that being able to apply information theory to it doesn't necessarily mean that the it to which you've applied it has anything in common with any of the other uh, things to which you could apply it. Um, so there's a lot of uh, also use of the word pattern and pattern identification. And that's the part that I think is going to be an important connection between discussions in causation in philosophy and discussions about causation and pattern identification in machine learning. Um, there is, of course, causation and causality, which will be the focus of this talk. Uh, and there's different notions of intervention um, and what counts as intervening in a particular system. I could also put up mechanism here. I think the term mechanism gets used rampantly and it's a very, um, there's usually good uh, reasons to be using it in the context in which it's being used. Nevertheless, there's genuine differences in how it gets used such that, you know, someone's talking about a mechanism here and someone's talking about a mechanism here that cannot be talking about the same thing. And so it is worth sort of putting a little red flag on usages of those, uh, of that term. All right. So um, this is just a little sort of philosophical aside. Um, so I, I take a kind of pragmatist approach to when should we lump together ideas and say, no, really, there is one thing that is causation that, that we're talking about. And when should we split it apart and say, no, really, when you're talking about mechanisms, you know, here's five different notions of mechanism that have to be distinguished and can't be assimilated to each other. So I think there's, you know, some people just have inclinations towards lumping or towards splitting, but I think there's really good uh, uh, reasons to look for how to get theoretical cohesiveness using lumping and splitting uh, that should be guiding it instead of just, you know, what are you naturally inclined to do? So for splitting, um, one reason why you might want to split uh, a concept and say that these different usages refer to genuinely different kinds of um, things in the world is that you then have more homogeneity of the behavior once you identify an instance of something. Um, and once you have identified an instance of something under this sort of narrower construal, then you can usually make stronger inferences about it as a result. Uh, so I've argued elsewhere that we should construe causation in particular narrowly. Like it should be sort of hard for something to count as a specifically causal relationship. Because if you try and use causation for lots of different kinds of things, then you've now watered down this term so much that you can no longer use it to draw good inferences along the, the causal structures that you identify. So you get more inferential payoff if you construe it more narrowly, precisely because there's more homogeneity of behavior in the systems to which you're applying it. Um, oops. All right. And ironically for this particular uh, talk on causation, I'm going to be advocating that we sort of lump causation, that we take a whole bunch of incredibly disparate things and say, no, really, there is something that they do in fact all have in common. Uh, and that, there's a payoff for bringing such an incredibly disparate number of phenomena under the single umbrella of causation. And there is the genuine explanatory character of the unification of those phenomena by seeing how they really all can count as instances of causation. So if there is anything that such a wide variety of phenomena do have in common and we can give an adequately precise characterization of it, then I think we really should. And those are kind of the the, the big payoff moments in the development of new paradigms when you can find those key unifying concepts uh, that, that sort of bring together so many different things. So is there a genuinely um, unequivocal or univocal construal of causation in machine learning and AI especially? Um, 
in conversations, I, I've been talking especially with somebody named Oliver Schulte, who was trained in philosophy and now works in computer science here. And he's just always struck when philosophers do um, causation, like everything's so spatio-temporal. There's like a time and a place for it. Uh, and the stuff that he's working on really doesn't have a sort of clear spatio-temporal location in the, the same sort of way. Um, However, I really think that there's still uh, one notion of causation that we're all talking about, even when you're talking about causal relationships among, say, unsupervised learning algorithms. Um, so by keeping it together, we're going to be able to sort of refine the different approaches by, by, by sort of using them as constraints on each other. So that said, I don't think there's a single univocal notion of intervention that happens in all of these. Um, but I, I do think that in the case of causation, there will turn out to be. So we'll talk about the, the data phenomena distinction here in just a, just a moment. All right, so uh, Shulkopf has this recent paper, Causality for Machine Learning. Um, and it's really interesting because he's also trying to do uh, this project of sort of adding something more foundational to discussions of causation. And he wants to situate it as a thing that you really need in order to make further progress in machine learning. Um, just as a side note, he uses the term causality. I tend to use the term causation. There is no uniform choice of words, but I'm going to be using them interchangeably. Uh, so I do take it to just be two different ways of, of, you know, two different ways of referring to the same thing, causality and causation. Um, all right, so he wants to uh, make progress on machine learning by incorporating causality into it. And the paper is largely short subsections that give you, you know, here's eight different ways that we could possibly go about doing this. And they're all really helpful and interesting because he's trying to put them into a unified framework. At the same time, they're all of necessity very uh, schematic and brief because there's, you know, eight of them crammed into a single paper. Um, but there are several points that I, you know, found especially interesting. One is that, uh, Within approaches to causation in philosophy of science, especially those who sort of take an interventionist semantics on causal based nets, then there's a huge emphasis on doing statistics. Like really what you're looking for is certain kind of relationships among data in a data set. And you're doing a lot of statistical analyses on those sorts of things. And Shulkopf, of course, is very aware of those sorts of things, but he wants to sort of supplement that in a way that I think would be helpful in the philosophy of science side as well to say, look, you know, even before you, you know, you, you don't have to just talk about doing, uh, you know, statistical analyses on data sets. There's also just sometimes you can skip straight to modeling the causal structure in the system itself before you get to the data that was taken from that kind of system, because we're usually not completely ignorant about it. And uh, I got very excited when he was talking about the gold standard of, of modeling. Like, no, really, if you have a set of like a couple differential equations, you can do an awful lot for getting the bones of the causal structure of some system that will then supplement the statistical analyses that you're doing over here. So Sperdy's Gleamer and Shinies and others have really done as much as they could without ever having to talk about the system itself. Um, but I think that we've sort of reached the end of that trajectory and we need to sort of supplement the statistical analyses on the data sets with this kind of, um, I don't know, more old fashioned modeling. Uh, so sports logic is the, the group that um, Oliver Schultz has been working with and they essentially perform a lot of uh, analyses on sports stuff. So if you need to know how well your hockey team is doing, then you can go talk to um, you can go talk to them. Uh, so they use, so now we're going to sort of talk about, okay, how does this, you know, why would we think this is not a form of causation um, that's like the one discussed in philosophy? And then why would we think it is like that form? All right. So the notion of information that you can find in lots of uh, examples that are given in the machine learning literature are not the same as the one that Sholkoff points out as the potentially conserved quantity discussed by physicists. So there's just so many different ways in which you can identify information um, that, uh, that there's reason to think that if you're talking about information and causation, there's not one single thing that the information is. And in particular, you might be concerned that when you're talking about causal relationships among bits of programming in a high, pro, uh, high level programming language, then um, 
this just isn't the kind of causation that philosophers were talking about before, because causation was supposed to be extensional. It was supposed to be a relationship in the world between things that were in the world, not uh, something that's taking place in a high level programming environment. Okay, um, but I think that there's this uh, distinction between data and phenomena uh, from Bogan and Woodward in 1988. I don't think they envisioned the usage that it could now be put to. Um, but one of the things that it's really helpful about is that, you know, what counts as the data that you're using for a particular, for modeling a particular uh, system's causal structure, you can then use that system as the data for modeling some further causal structure in these layered effects that get you actually to the spatiotemporal part of uh, traditional causation. So for instance, what sports logic does is you can take a lot of video feeds um, from different angles of, let's say, like a European football game. Um, and those video feeds are the data that they're then using a variety of analyses on in order to generate a model of the game itself. So where actually were the people, where were they moving and what were they doing? And now you just have, a, as it were, a sort of complete model of actually, like, you know, what happened on the field at that time. Um, and now that becomes the data on which you're going to run other sorts of analyses. So that's now you want to talk about, um, okay, what was the like the past completion rate for a certain kind of player over the course of this game? Or how many times did we lose the ball in this particular uh, section of the field? So you started with the video feeds that were data that you were using to sort of reconstruct this phenomenon that was the game itself that really had a spatiotemporal location. You're now taking the game that you reconstructed and using it as the data on which you're going to perform further analyses so that you can get um, different kinds of information about the performance statistics of different kinds of plays or different kinds of players and so on. All right, so Wilkoff then wants to say, look, this is all really exciting. And this is why I started the whole talk with the uh, discussion of um, the sort of optimistic meta induction. Um, he says, look, the, the energy revolution um, really led to this fundamental shift in uh, society because it led to industrialization, because we figured out that we could use energy as capital. And that really drove a great deal of technological development in addition to scientific development. And he says, look, we're right now in the information revolution and we figured out how to use information as capital and that's driving a great deal of this other uh, development at the same time, or in a similar way, I guess. Um, but the energy revolution required this distinction between energy and work. So energy by itself was not what was doing it. So if you look at, oops, um, if you look at what was going on with the industrialization, for instance, and you look at things like um, developing ways to measure the efficiency of the transformation of heat into momentum for steam engines. Um, then what you have is not just that energy was doing um, a great deal of revolutionary work, but that a distinction between energy and the work that you can do with energy and the limits on how you can transform different amounts and kinds of energy into different forms of work was what was really driving things forward, like in a literal fashion, like the, 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 uh, the increasing the efficiency of steam engines is why we have the second law, like the Carnot cycles um, from thermodynamics in the form that we do. So in this sense, work is not some new different substance uh, that's in addition to energy. Um, it's also not nothing. It's sort of energy where you add certain sorts of constraints and you have certain kinds of system boundaries. So it's what you can do with energy. And similarly, I want to say that we're not just in an information revolution because that's not enough. Um, really, it's it's causation that is the where the rubber hits the road part. Um, and it's, you know, causality is not wholly distinct from information. And it's not just relabeled information. But it is if you take information and add additional constraints when you're identifying instances and you assess it with respect to certain kinds of added system boundaries, then what you get is causality or causation. So essentially, causation is what can be done with information in the same way that work is what can be done with energy. All right. So just to be, before we get to the, um, to the next part, I just want to be clear that I'm not saying that causation is literally work. Um, 
it would be very lovely if we could just take the equations for work and borrow them to measure causation. But uh, I don't think it's going to I, I don't think it's going to work quite that uh, uh, easily. But it is a claim about how these concepts stand with respect to each other in these sort of like really large scale theoretical and paradigm shaping sorts of ways. Um, so it is, let's see, partially a response to philosophers who get very concerned about whether or not causation is real in the right kind of way. And they there's lots of different notions of what could count as real in the right kind of way. Um, but this is, I, I wanna argue work is real, even though it's not real in the way that energy is. And similarly, causation is real, but not in the way that um, information is. So it's kind of an alleviation of that. All right, so this is the part that we're, that is, is still the kind of work in progress. As you can see, I haven't exactly figured out how to fill in all of the um, sections of this table, but I think one of the main points of comparison that come out of this uh, has implications for philosophers in particular, and also for thinking about the world in terms of a kind of like micro physical deterministic sort of way. So in particular, we have energy as conserved and work is not conserved. And we have information as probably a conserved quantity, um, that notion of information. And we have uh, causation as not conserved. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but I really think this is one of the central uh, payoffs of thinking about this analogy between energy and work and information and causation. That what it takes to model something that is not conserved is very different than, it does, than, than uh, what it takes to model something that is conserved. And it explains a lot of the things about causation and why it behaves the way it does, especially at higher levels. Um, and it also explains, as we'll see in a, a moment, why you can do so much at the higher levels without ever having to talk about anything that's microphysical or conserved. Um, so moving down just a bit, um, energy. So for instance, if you think just about something as basic as um, let's say potential energy, then you, know, you have your rock and you wanna move it to the top of the building. Uh, then the amount of potential energy that it's going to have up there is independent of the path that you use to get the rock to the top. Whereas the amount of work that you have to do to get the, the rock to the top is going to be dependent on the path that you take. This doesn't mean that it's somehow subjective or less real or not really part of the world. Uh, it's not that, so you can have different amounts of work depending on different paths that you could choose. And you're gonna choose a path that's easier for you and you're still gonna be individuating paths that seem salient because there are things that are you know, perhaps the only options that you see pragmatically available to you. Nevertheless, this doesn't mean that it's somehow like made up or just an invention or something like this. And I think the same thing happens over in the information and causation side. So uh, I think that in a lot of cases, if you're thinking about say, um, the relationship between two causal variables, then the amount of say mutual information between them is going to be a fixed quantity and it's not going to necessarily be path dependent. On the other hand, the causal relationships between them will be path dependent. So if there's more than one path between them, then you might still have the same amount of shared information if you're just assessing the variables, but uh, the, the actual causal relationships will be path dependent in a way that's similar to uh, the work example. So for work, it's also going to be system relative in that if you redraw the boundaries of how you're assessing what the, uh, um, for instance, if you have some sort of like temperature gradient, uh, if you reassess the boundaries, um, then you're going to change, for instance, the amount of work that it might take to move something or to heat it up to a certain temperature. And similarly, causation is going to be system relative. So what the causal relationships are, um, R is partially contingent on what the variables are that are put into a system to be considered. And this has struck a lot of philosophers of science anyways as being sort of uncomfortably um, dependent on individual human choice. Like surely we don't want the causal structure of the world to be just dependent on what I happen to choose as the variables that I put into my system. And so the system relativity of causal structure is kind of like, eh, I, don't, I don't really like that. Um, but I think it's very, very similar to the system relativity of work. Um, and it's just 
you know, there's lots of different ways you could individuate the system and the world itself is not going to tell you the one right way to do work or what the one right amount of work is that it would take to, you know, bring the rock to the top of the building. Similarly, there's lots of different kinds of causal structure you could find and you have to sort of commit by picking the variables that are going to go into, uh, into the system. Um, and then for the last one, uh, so there's a kind of reversibility with anything that is uh, going to be in the conserved side for the energy and information. Um, but work, you're only going to get reversible in a certain kind of ideal limit. And I actually think that causation is very similar to work in this regard, where it's only going to be reversible in a very ideal limit, where it's sort of a kind of perfectly deterministic uh, connection that only goes along one path. Um, in the absence of that limit, then it's not going to be fully reversible. It will have this embedded temporal asymmetry to it. Um, yeah. All right. So this is the part where, yeah, I'd, I'd welcome some questions or suggestions or comments. Um, I'm now going to just say a little bit about the non-conservation of causation. Um, so this There we go. Uh, you might think, well, okay, so accounts of causation vary wildly with respect to the physical mechanisms, and some of them, like interventionism, specifically avoid talking about physical mechanisms. Um, so Jim Woodward has an example where he says, look, you know, if you have a conversation with a ghost, and then they just completely disappear in some non-physical way, and they come back the next day and they continue the conversation, you know, you, you really think that you're telling them to think about this and they come back and tell you they thought about it, how to causal effect, even though there's literally no mechanism that you can come up with for it. Um, and I think that's true, uh, but I think that even in the cases where you might be most inclined to think that there is something that is preserved across instances of uh, causal exchange, that there would be, you know, um, some sort of notion of cause, or excuse me, conservation that comes out of it. So there is at least one account of causation. Um, so I think Wes Salmon's 1998 version uh, involves the propagation and exchange of conserved quantities. So I think this is the most friendly place if you want to make the case that um, causation is something that ought to be treated as if it were conserved. I put Phil Dow in here, but in parentheses, because it's not clear what his uh, <coughs> take is on this diagram that we have right here on the um, on the left hand side. So what Salmon offers is a view where, um, let's see, the uh, edges that you see here in these sort of diagrammatic representations are the propagation of uh, conserved quantities through space and time. And <clears throat> the interactions or the vertices here are the exchanges of conserved quantities over time. And if we were looking at the, the one that's labeled billiard balls, so this is the one that's very familiar and sort of intuitively um, appealing to lots of people. The idea is just that, you know, two things come together, they exchange a conserved quantity, they go off in a different direction. You can sort of recreate everything. That's what I mean by in the ideal limit, that's the sort of, uh, ide of that's the sort of construal of causation that is um, reversible. <coughs> in contrast, we have these other two kinds. So the next one is called a Y interaction. And this is something where one can, a conserved quantity is propagating as one edge in the graph, and then it spontaneously fissions. It comes apart into two things and then goes as separate uh, edges in the graph. And he gives us this example of the chicken, which I think is very misleading. Um, it has nothing to do with biology or reproduction whatsoever. I think he did himself a great disservice by focusing on eating and uh, egg laying. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. And similarly, we have the lambda one, where two things come together and then stick. So, <coughs> sorry, I seem to have a dust in my throat. All right. So. In this sort of way, causation can fail to be conserved because causation is those edges and vertices in the graph, even though all of the quantities are conserved. <clears throat> all right, so this will reset, right? Oh, there we go. 
So this just sort of illustrates it. This is just a little animation. Is this showing for people? Can somebody nod? Oh, yes, yeah, showing. Okay. Um, so the ball surface area is actually conserved. Uh, and you can see there's just a random uh, generator for when you will have x, y, or lambda interactions. Uh, and so you can really see sometimes you get a lot on one, and sometimes you get uh, a larger number of smaller lines. <coughs> Um, the upshot of this is the total number of edges and vertices in this nexus changes over time. Sometimes there's more or less. But causation is those edges and vertices, not simply the total quantity of the conserved quantities that are transmitted along and exchanged through those edges and vertices. And so even in the, trans the transfer of conserved quantities account, the most you know, conservation-friendly account of causation Causation itself is not conserved. So for instance, um, if you take causal relata to be patterns that are instantiated or identifiable in that causal nexus, then which patterns can be instantiated in a given region of the nexus is going to be a function of the complexity of the nexus in that area. So if you think about, for instance, the game of life, if you only have like a two by two grid, then there's extraordinarily few interesting patterns that you could actually instantiate there. I think uh, <clears throat> in order to get a glider, I think you need at least something like a six by six grid. I, I can't remember. So you need a certain kind of degree of freedom in the, the pixel analogs themselves before you can instantiate patterns of a certain complexity. So if you want to look at something like a Turing machine in the game of life, then you need a great deal more uh, pixel degrees of freedom than would be present in the six by six grid in which you could get the simpler pattern. So the patterns that are instantiatable or the causal relata that you could find in that causal nexus is partially determined by the degrees of freedom in the nexus, but that changes over time. All right, so insofar as you've got causation as a relation in there, then what causal relations there are changes over time in a way that's deeply unconserved, even though you're not losing any conserved quantities. All right, so um, one of the other things to sort of bring us back around to the, to the beginning of the talk, um, I think that a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of people in the philosophy of science literature think that when you're trying to make a certain kind of causal claim, you have to bottom it out every single time. You have to sort of bring it down to the basic fundamental level in order to show that this particular causal claim is a legitimate one. Um, but I think for both work and for causation, you can calculate it and model it in lots of different systems without ever having to actually invoke what the fundamental bits of the world are that are doing the work for you. That connection has to be there somewhere in the theoretical setting, but you shouldn't be using it every time you're trying to do a calculation or model something. Um, and every time we decide, oh, I'm gonna like call for you to account for how does this connect to the, the foundation of causation is just to fail to be doing normal science. So that's just what it means to not yet have a sufficiently shared set of assumptions. Um, so I, I think the causal foundations need to be really solid and they need to exist, but then we need to stop thinking about them because then we can do the next stage of more interesting work. They need to sort of sink out of view. All right. Um, and I, I think that this analogy between work and energy and causation and information sort of explains why a lot of philosophers since Reichenbach have been looking at the extremely suggestive connections between thermodynamics and causation and time. Um, so I don't have time to really go into any of that, but I, I, I think this at least accounts for why those similarities have been so uh, sort of prominent and then explored over the years um, by a variety of people. So as I said before, I think these are just analogies, they're not literal equivalences, but I think they could be fruitfully exploited. Um, in the sense that once you say that you need to unify uh, so many different kinds of methodological approaches because they are in fact studying the same kind of thing, even though it's a very, very abstract quantity, um, 
it provides a certain kind of uh, coordinating guidance on how you should shift between different approaches. So it lets you fill in, okay, I, I ran out of stuff over here, now I need to uh, come up with something from over there. So for instance, um, I have a little work on causal faithfulness violations in causal based nets. So this is the case where two variables are connected by two different paths that are precisely counterbalanced. So it looks like the two variables are probabilistically independent of one another because this path brings about the effect with exactly the same weight that this path suppresses it. So that's a, 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 called a, a causal faithfulness violation. And in the causal based net stuff, for instance, with Sperdy's Gleamer and Shinies, they're like, eh, that's, you know, inconvenient. Yeah, they're, they're there. It's just sort of an anomaly and they don't, it's, it's, you know, let's, let's hope we don't get a lot of those. Um, except for the fact that the things that have that sort of structure are going to be ubiquitous when you're doing sort of biological systems and lots of other places where you have damped harmonic oscillators. Uh, so I think that you can actually use this kind of analogy as a way of providing guidance for how you can solve this problem with causal faithfulness triangles by sort of identifying them in the graph and now using supplemental, uh, essentially you can model them as damped harmonic oscillators, which are ubiquitous. And then you can find a characteristic time scale for damping and the, the damping parameter such that you now know how rapidly you're going to have to measure them in order to find uh, that there is some sort of uh, signal going through before it gets damped down to zero. So you can use one to sort of solve a problem in the other if you take this sort of univocal approach to it. All right. And that's pretty much it. I want to say, you know, causation is not this fundamental quantity in the world, but contra some of, anyways, the, the philosopher's um, concerns about this, that doesn't make it less real, less useful, or less objective. It's not something we're just making up. Um, and we can really see this when we see the relation between energy and work. Um, I like being able to respond to the philosopher's objections to causation by saying, well, if you object to that, then you have to pretty much object to this huge edifice in physics and good luck with that. Um, so there's a way of kind of borrowing credibility uh, to solve a problem somewhere else. And um, I think that this kind of unification is really helpful for setting out a kind of path for how to bring together these incredibly disparate um, areas of research. And that is it. All right, thanks. I'm gonna... Thank you, Holly. That was wonderful. Um... Great. So, uh, and you finished exactly on time. So we have, uh, let's say, uh, 10 minutes for questions. I want to make sure we have uh, a few minutes for a break between uh, Holly's talk and Matt's talk. Um, so uh, as I said before, if you have questions, please use the hand raising tool. Um, you're also welcome to put questions into the chat box uh, and, and I can read them from there. Okay. So we have a question from Valentis and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, please unmute yourself. Let, let me unmute myself. Uh, just just a, a short question regarding wh why should we expect from, uh, from uh, Solomon's theory of causation to be conserved? Okay. I mean, in the sense that it is formulated in terms of conserved quantities and the same holds for Dow's theory of causation. However, that doesn't mean that should be conserved itself. I mean, I, 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 it's not clear the notion of being conserved to me. Okay, yeah. hey, that's my question. Okay, uh, yeah. Take, well, it, take it as a clarification as a, as a clarificatory question. Yeah. Um, so it's a good question, and in some sense, uh, you are not the target audience for that because you're already convinced of this thing. Um, so it, it might just be that you don't share the intuitions. Uh, I can definitely say that I often get pushback on this, like, of course it's going to be conserved. How could it not be conserved? Um, so in that sense, I'm trying to undermine a certain kind of intuition of the following sort. So for a lot of philosophers who don't work so much in physics. So I, I spend a lot of time talking to people who maybe work in philosophy of biology or philosophy of economics, and their interventionist approaches are really super useful. Um, they want to know things like, uh, you know, I, I'm giving this causal relationship. Um, 
one of the classic examples is, uh, you know, from the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, if you have, you know, low democratic norms and you're very rich, but only in a single resource, then there's a certain probability that you're going to have a civil war in the next 10 years. Um, so those things look like they're causally related to bringing about civil war in a certain kind of way. And you're like, yeah, but really, there is something that's happening that is very small particles bumping into other very small particles in this like perfectly deterministic dance of very small billiard balls that only just uh, sort of trace out this little physical path. So there is this idea that, you know, whatever is happening with a, an apparently higher level causal relationship, there must be something that you could cash it out in terms of that is perfectly conserved interactions between essentially what they learn, you know, ideal gas, uh, like if you're thinking of ideal gases as like very small billiard balls, yeah. So there, there's a really widespread intuition though that really that's what causation is, is very small things bumping into each other only in the shape of the X interactions as a result of which, you know, you should be able to have this sort of very clean micro deterministic thing where it is conserved in the sense that you never have an increase or decrease in the degrees of freedom in the nexus. So I am trying to get them away from that to the, you shouldn't think that it's conserved. Right, thanks Valentise. I, I have Noel next. Thanks. Um, so towards the end, at one point you mentioned that, um, sorry, let me shut my email up. Um, you mentioned that, uh, res or sometimes when we, we don't resist diving down to some deeper, more fundamental level, that marks a kind of failure to do normal science. Is the thought, I was confused by that point, is the thought here that if we treat the science of causation as its own sort of standalone, stable discipline, it's got to have some framework set of assumptions that are multiply realizable, or I, I, just, I was confused by that point. Yeah, so it's um, it's more, uh, and to be fair, I don't think that causation is yet a standalone science. I think it's in the process of becoming one. And I'm making a Kuhnian point there about sort of um, getting challenged on one's, on, on like very foundational issues is characteristic of something that hasn't yet settled into the pattern of normal science. So it's not foundational in the sense of like fundamental physics per se, except okay. that often that's what the call comes as for the biologist. They're like, no, but really it's just all small particles bumping into other small particles. And you're like, no, it's not. Um, it, it's more about the foundations of the field itself in a theoretical context. You know, if you have to keep having massive disagreements about like, is there even such a thing as a physical mechanism for it? Or is it entirely these abstract counterfactuals? Then you're, you're arguing about foundations still. And once you can get to a certain place where you're spending less time arguing about foundations, then you thereby are at a different stage of the theoretical development for the paradigm. Yeah, that makes more sense. Thanks. Thanks, Noel. Uh, next, I have Carl Hefer. Carl? So uh, thanks, Ollie. That was really interesting, and, and I like the perspective that you're outlining. But to me, the hardest part of the analogy to grasp was the role of information. So I wanted to ask you to to say a little bit more about what you mean um, by information in the context of normal things of causation that we talk about, like when when you talk about the billiard balls, the usual uh, simple philosopher's example. Where's the information, or what kind of information is it? Um, because when, when I think of the phrase that you used, um, um, information that we can use, in analogy to the work as energy we can use, um, it seems to me that um, the word structure leaps to my mind more than information, like causation is structure we can use. But, but anyway, I'm just asking for a little more clarification about information's role. All right. Um, no, that's a, a very good question, and it's the part where I punted because um, I have a whole other project that's on an informational account of causation, um, and I was either going to have to put too much of it into the talk or none of it into the talk, and I went with none of it, um, but that's exactly the hole where I would have put that, uh, that sort of account. Um, so, and, and, and this just sort of, in, in some sense, I would like to 
point you towards this 2017 paper that I have called Patterns, Information, Causation, uh, because that is the longer version of um, what I'm talking about. Um, so the, the notion of information that I'm talking about uh, is sort of uh, manifests in two ways. Um, I don't think it's twofold. I think it's the, the same thing. Um, and I think this comes from Salmon too. So Salmon talks about the different parts of the world having like actual um, informational connectivity with each other. Uh, and I think that the way in which information is talked about as a potentially conserved quantity in physics uh, is exactly the, the, the sort of thing that Salmon was, was getting to there. Um, and I think there's something really potentially useful about using um, measures of informational connectivity to then apply to specific kinds of like physical bits of the world to see whether or not they are causally connected to each other. So that's part of the metaphysics of causation project. Um, but the, the, the issue is this, um, just applying information theory, like just, you know, taking different kinds of measures of like mutual information or joint information. Um, you can do that to tons of different things. And that doesn't, you can get some non-zero answer, but it doesn't mean that they're causally connected. Um, so the, 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 the point of that other paper is to say, look, here's what you have to do to the traditional notion of causation and causal relata to get it into a form such that it's now clear how you can make it into, for instance, uh, volumes in phase space that you can put partitions on and then use those partitions to directly apply informational measures. So it stops short of doing the application, but it gets things to the place where you could directly apply it and know that what if you're applying it to those targets, you're now tracking causal relationships because um, you're applying it to the right sort of thing. But I, I left that out, sorry, because it was I, I couldn't find a way of making it fit in the time. Thanks. We have time for one more question. I have Joanna. Uh, Joanna, I'm sorry. Uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Joanna uh, from Krakow. Um, I'm thinking about your analogy uh, and concerning uh, the energy work part. Um, we can say numerically uh, what part of energy is in a given situation uh, work. So if for a given physical system, there is 10 joules energy, we could say that five joules out, out of this is work and the rest is say heat. And mm -hmm. my question is whether uh, in your account, uh, we could also say in a similar uh, numerical way we could give numbers <laughs> what part of information in a given situation is causation mm -hmm. and uh, whether we could somehow tell something about the rest in the case of energy uh, often the rest of energy is heat could we say something about information that is not causation Yes, is the short answer. Um, and the long answer is that's so working up exactly such a like an example or an exemplar like a case study of it um, is what I'm is sort of the current part of the project. Yeah, so I, I, I think that the goal is to be able to just give a measure and um, there will have to be a lot of stipulation of, you know, these are the variables that we're talking about. These are, uh, this is the particular system in the world that we're looking at for the instances of those variables taking values. Um, you'll, you'll have to fill in a lot of stuff, but to sort of just show like you can turn it into a much more familiar modeling problem. Um, and that's how I think we'll have like really accomplished something in the study of causation is when you now just have, okay, well, here's a kind of modeling problem and here's how you solve it. That's much more akin to what you learn when you're learning how to do, um, you know, when you're learning how to calculate work in physics. So we're there, but I don't have the, I can't show you the animation for that one yet. <laughs> thanks, Joanna. And thanks again to Holly. That was a wonderful talk. So we'll give another round of applause to Holly. Thank you so much. All right, we have a few minutes for a break. Uh, Matt, if you want to get your slides up and running um, and, uh, and we'll take a pause for five minutes once Matt's up and running and we'll reconvene here. We'll plan to begin at 2.01. We'll give a minute for people to, to log in before we start Matt's talk. <laughs> 